A quick word. The conversations in this podcast with Devon Nixon and Anthony Henderson were recorded before SAG AFTRA went on strike. You can't act like magic. You gotta be magic. You can't be out there thinking it's gonna happen again. Yeah. 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 How I stop thinking that? Hey, that's simple. Stop thinking. Welcome to the official Winning Time podcast from HBO. I'm Rodney Barnes, executive producer on HBO's Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. It's basketball, motherfucker. It ain't rocket science. There's a word the Latins use, suave. It means easy. For the first time in three decades, the defending champion is about to be eliminated from round one of the playoffs. Today, we'll check in with sports writer and best-selling author Jeff Perlman, whose book, Showtime, Magic, Kareem, Riley, and the Los Angeles Lakers Dynasty of the 1980s, inspired our show. After that, we'll sit down with Devon Nixon, who plays the legendary Norm Nixon on our show. He also has the added benefit of being Norm's son. At the end of the episode, we'll chat with Devon's body double, Anthony Henderson, about bringing this season's on-court action to life. But first, a little recap. This episode is called The Magic is Back and was directed by Trey Edward Schultz in the middle of the 1981 season. Magic returns from his knee injury but is unable to gel with the rest of the team, especially Norm Nixon. The Bus family is ascendant while the Lakers front office is in conflict. Riley and Westhead clash. They make the playoffs, but at the buzzer, Magic misses a hero shot. The Lakers are eliminated. Some of these scenes and moments and instances are fictional. We add them in to tie facts together and to weave a narrative that is compelling. Again, some things are fictional, but they're inspired by true events that we hope you greatly enjoy and watch from week to week. Let's dive on in. All right, once again, our first guest is Jeff Perlman, the author of the book Showtime. Jeff. Thanks again for being here. How come when you introduce me, you never say author and also a dashingly good-looking man? Well, here's the thing. People can't see. <laughs> so let's talk about um, this episode where now Magic is returning to the team. He's been out, had a really, really bad knee injury, and he's coming back. Can you speak to the specifics of how the team felt about Magic's return? I would say uh, conflicted. On the one hand, you have this guy, and he's a tremendous player, and, you know, he, he's, he's led you to a lot of glory. On the other hand, you're kind of doing well without him. Yes. And he has an ego. The thing is that's really forgotten about those teams is Norm Nixon was a great point guard. Mm-hmm. Like, Norm Nixon was a legit NBA all-star point guard. Mm-hmm. And when they drafted Magic Johnson, they added another legit NBA all-star point guard. So... Without Magic, you're still being run by a point guard. You're run by a point guard who is a terrifically unselfish player in many ways, and you're winning. And probably more the prototypical idea of what a point guard had been up until that point before Magic. Very much so. Small, quick, and also less of a defense. Like, Magic was not a great defensive point guard. People forget that. He was okay, but he wasn't great, and he wasn't – he was big. So it's hard for a 6'9 guy to guard a 6'2 guy. That's a a flaw of it all. So he comes back. And people are sort of mixed about it all. They're happy he's back. They could deal a little bit without the ego. So all of a sudden, everyone is waiting for Magic to come back. The fans are talking to Magic back. The headlines, the Magic is back. And, you know, there are a lot of very accomplished players on that roster. I mean, Jamal Wilkes is a Hall of Famer. Yeah. Norm Nixon, again, one of the great point guards in the NBA. And everyone's waiting for Magic to come back. And you're kind of like, what about us? That first game back, the crowd's reaction... All of that. Mm. Now Magic's back. You've got this big personality both on the floor and in the locker room and also rubbing the coach the wrong way. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because even though he's from Michigan, he was made for L.A., right? So the hype of his return was enormous. So on the one hand, you just have the hype. And you have, at the time, the various L.A. newspapers, the Times and the Daily News, building this up as his triumphant return. Mm-hmm. And this is an enormous deal. 
And it's almost like in sports every now and then, it'll be like, man, that team was, if you thought they were good now, wait till they add this piece. Right. Happens all the time, actually. And a lot of times it doesn't work out yeah. because when something is rolling well, adding an extra piece doesn't always, you know, it's like when the Houston Rockets had Ralph Sampson and they had Hakeem Olajuwon. Whoa, if they're good with one big man, imagine they were two big men. Well, it's hard to fit two big men in one lineup. Magic comes back, then everyone's thrilled. LA's thrilled. It's electrifying. You would think it's happy, happy, glory, glory. But inside the locker room, it's a real mixed bag of emotions. On the one hand, wow, Magic's back, and that's our boy, and he, we're cool, and it's great, and he's worked hard to get back. And on the other hand, we were rolling along, and we were really good without him. And there's baggage with Magic Johnson. He can be a pain in the ass. He can be moody, and he could be egotistical at times. And behind the scenes, everyone knows the smile of Magic Johnson, but behind the scenes, he's he can be difficult at times. And then there's the element of Paul Westhead. Like, Paul Westhead was a Kareem-centric coach. Jack McKinney was a Magic Center coach and a Guard Center coach. Paul West said it all is based around Kareem. Cap, cap, cap. We're all going to do what Cap says. Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden, you have a player coming back. He can't stand the coach. He does view himself as sort of the blooming centerpiece of the team. He's been told he's a centerpiece of the team. But you have these players who are winning with Kareem in the middle. And Kareem, for any negatives, he is a no-fuss player. Right. He's not going to whine to you about not getting the ball. He's not going to complain about this and that. So it's kind of a pain in the ass when he comes back. How do you see Michael Cooper fitting into this? Because we've got that scene where we make the guys make up and hug, and Cooper's at the center of that. Juxtapose the reality. First of all, I love Michael Cooper. I think he's one of the great characters in the show and also just one of the joys. Shout out to Delonte D'Souza. Love Delonte. Yes. You're not going to meet a nicer guy than Delonte. He's just a joy. But, you know, like, again, magic comes back, and it's like, a lot of these guys don't know how to feel. Like, Cooper is actually benefiting playing under Westhead. Like, it's actually kind of working well for Michael Cooper's career. And you have this guy, Magic, who's a complete opposite, who's chopping him down, chopping him down, chopping him down. And Cooper's blooming. Like, like I, you have to remember, the guy came out of nowhere. He was a nobody who made the Lakers as the last guy initially, you know. And all of a sudden, Magic comes along, and it's sort of this antagonism toward Westhead. And you inherently to be an athlete another thing oftentimes is you have to be selfish and yeah winning is important but my career is more important and eating is more important and michael cooper is always paranoid about losing his job what's going to happen to me how am i going to survive this and the return of magic was a real awkward period for him and his career prospects we have a moment coming up where we're talking about moving norm nixon mm. another player i think in history that doesn't necessarily get his due for his impact on the game can you speak to the specifics of what the idea of that trade that potential trade would have been and what do you think would have happened to the laker team if david thompson had become a laker i know Wes had caught a lot of grief for not signing off on the deal i know the lakers were excited by the prospects of adding david thompson if you remember david thompson especially at nc state mm -hmm. he kicked ass he was awesome I don't think he would have been a terrific fit with the Lakers. I actually think West said was kind of right. I think playing alongside Kareem, playing on a team with a lot of scorers and a lot of guys who could put the ball in the hoop, he was not a very good defensive player, David Thompson. Now, they were great enough players that it yeah. could have worked, but I just think the Lakers are not a play a land of score first yeah. and do nothing else players. It's part of the, what made him great. So I actually think David Thompson not coming to the Lakers was a much better end result. We really build up this idea of Norm Nixon's comments mm. to the press really rubbing some of the wounds that we have festering yeah. within the team. Can you speak to the specificity of that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I can tell you as a guy who's been a reporter for a long time and who covered sports for a long time, what you always want as a reporter is a go-to guy who you can talk to and who can give you the lowdown on the team. It's very, very important if you're a beat writer. When I was a baseball writer at Sports Illustrated, I had different guys in different clubhouses who I know I could go to, and it's not always a star. It's just someone you can talk to who will tell you, on or off the record, just so you know, everyone hates the manager. Or just so you know, <laughs> that guy sucks, or he's tipping his pitches, or whatever it was. I would have, and I'm telling you, it would always be, for me, it was guys like Gerald Williams with the Yankees, right. you know, or Eddie Perez with the Braves. It wouldn't be the big name guys. Right. It'd be someone in the margins. And Norm Nixon, who was a big name, but he became the guy who a lot of writers could go to and he would say quietly, you know, people don't like magic that much around here. Or, 
you know, Westhead system, we're not, people aren't feeling that. So when he went on the record and criticized Magic, it carried a lot of weight because he usually didn't go on the record. He usually went, this, look, this is off the record. This is between right. you and me. So when he actually went on the record, it carried a absolute boatload of weight because he usually didn't. Wow. He usually was quiet. Jeff, what's going on with Pickfair? Bus's new pad. I always looked at it like, you know, Hef's place, yeah. you know, the Playboy Mansion and all of that. Can you speak a little bit about what it was really like? Or was it that? I think you kind of nailed it. I mean, you know, if we're being honest sitting here in 2023, and I know Jerry Buss wasn't judged by 2023 standards, yes, yes. but he was kind of gross. Like, he was like, <laughs> I'm 51 years old. So Jerry Buss was even a little older than me at this time period. And he's like bringing in a bunch of like 19-year-old women while he has a daughter who's older than these women. And he's having these lavish parties, these Hef-esque parties. And he definitely fancied himself a Hef type guy. He just loved being surrounded by beautiful women, but inappropriately, you know, like kind of yeah. weird. And Pick Fair was like, it was a lot of things to him. It was a home, it was a status symbol. It was old Hollywood things he loved. And it was also just like this place where the babes would come. You know, like to go into eighties terms, and <laughs> that's what I yeah. like the way the way the babes. Would yeah, come. I, yeah, I would yeah, never yeah, call someone a yeah, babe in twenty twenty three, but that's how I kind of viewed it. It's a weird, weird place. In the show, we introduce a character named Honey Kaplan, who is a composite character based on a number of people. Can you talk about why Jerry Buss chose to settle down with our version of that character? I think he knew his image, and he also knew who he was, and I think like anyone whether you're addicted to sex or whether you're addicted to drugs or whatever, there are these times in your life where you try straightening out and you try sort of becoming something different and you try going counter to what people perceive you to be. And I do think there were moments where Jerry Best would look around and see that he's a dad with kids who are literally older than the women he was dating and sort of seek stability. And I would say more than anything, she symbolized sort of stability for a very brief period of time. One of the things that you see growing is the relationship between Pat Riley and Magic Johnson. Do you think that was purposeful, that he was undermining Westhead, or do you think it was just legitimate that the two of them had more in common and that he understood Magic in a way that Westhead didn't? See, I don't think Pat Riley was a duplicitous guy. Okay. I really don't. I think he was thrilled to be an assistant coach with the Lakers. I have to remember, it wasn't that long of a period of time between when he stopped playing, when he had no job, when he was miserable as Chicks announcer cohort. The fist. Yeah, the yeah, fist. yeah. I think Pat Riley, honest to God, saw in Magic Johnson a hardworking, driven, gritty basketball player with a lot more talent than he had had who needed some guidance right? and wasn't getting it from a coach he didn't like. I mean, if anything, it was the thin skin of Paul Westhead. Like, you right. should be happy that you have this guy who played in the league, unlike you, who wants to work with your star and actually make him better. In the 1981 playoffs, when we lose hmm. with Magic, taking that shot and all of that. Do you think Norm's sentiments played into the failure of that team, or do you think it was just a lack of chemistry with Magic sort of returning and all of that? I mean, there's a lot there, actually. Like, number one, it's very hard to it, win again. Yes. It just is. Yes. I know it's a cliche in sports, but yeah. it's really, really hard because everyone's gunning for you, and you're tired. And the thing that goes unspoken is... A lot of times when you win, you've accomplished your goal. And after you've accomplished a goal, you have these moments. One is the glee and the celebration. But the other one is, so that's it? Like, that's, right. all right, I won. That's well, I wrote a biography of Walter Payton. And when the Bears won the Super Bowl, Super Bowl twenty, in the aftermath of it all, he thought he was going to be giddy. And he was actually sad because he was kind of like, wait, all that work? Yeah. And that's it? So yeah. I get this piece of hardware and then I go home and my life is exactly the same. That's a huge thing that people don't talk about in sports, but it's very, very real. So you win this championship and you have the elation and you have the party and you have the parade and then you kind of come back and you're like, huh, so that's it. And then you really do start playing for different things because you've tasted the champagne and you're like, well, I also need more money. Like money mm -hmm. becomes a greater priority, celebrity, women, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, yeah, all yeah, yeah. kind of because you need to fill that gap that the winning was supposed to fill. And then you realize it didn't quite fill it the way I thought it would. And another hungry team comes along. Like, obviously, they were a much better team than the Houston Rockets. Yeah, like, yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. wasn't even close. 
but they didn't have that sort of thing. And also... That cohesion and all of that. Definitely. Yeah. And the, the hunger of it all. Yeah. You know, they kind of got snuck up on and just... Pfft. Why do you think he took that shot? Magic. Mind-numbing stupidity in a pressure moment. And he's a still a 21-year-old kid. Yeah. And sometimes you screw up in life. Yeah. And I think the thing, the great point that you just brought up, oftentimes it's an intrinsic thing where you have to find the stuff within you. It's not necessarily the drama of the guy next to you. You have to find within you that sense of purpose as to why you're going to get back on the horse and approach work ethic and discipline and all the things it takes to be great. You have to make that decision for you. I mean, it's kind of life if you think about it. Yeah. Jeff, thank you again for joining us. You know, hopefully the traffic wasn't as bad this time. The fact that you're paying me $10 million to be here makes it a little... <laughs> <laughs> 10 million you're getting 10 million yeah. are you not I'm getting pretzels <laughs> thank you again i look forward to talking to you again take it easy thank you i have with me devon nixon who plays his father the great storm and norman nixon devon thank you for coming on the podcast you're more than welcome sir season two yep all right, so the question I know you know is coming. Uh -huh. It has to come. Okay. Your father. Yep. How is he feeling about the show? You mm -hmm. playing him? Mm -hmm. Has it evolved since we talked about it last season? I think it's settled because, you know, just like we've been saying, it's a love letter to them. And I think that my dad now is realizing, you know, that... It's a good show. It's a solid show. And, and, you know, his friends come up to him and they're like, your son's doing a great job right. and this, that, and other. I saw uh, John Sally on a, on Rich Eisen and he was talking about, like, how I embodied my dad and, like, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was a cool compliment for me to get. But all in all, I think he's happy for us. I think he knows that it's a success. Right. A lot more basketball this season. Mm -hmm. What was the toll physically? What did it take? To get in shape and get all... I mean, you already... I know what you look like without your shirt on. <laughs> but going through the process, was it more this year? Because it did feel like it was a lot more basketball this year than last. It was, but I think that, you know, everybody did a good job of, you know, honing in on exactly what we needed because... Mm -hmm. We were walking into it a little bit blind first season, but now we figured out the moments. The choreography was a lot tighter, and the training was pretty similar. I mean, I use my double a lot more this season. <laughs> See, yeah, had to set it. I'm glad that showed some humility. Yeah, I'd have said it after you left. But go yeah. ahead. No, it's all good, man. I'm a real one. <laughs> so in this episode, magic comes back, mm -hmm. and Norm feels a way about it. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning, from season one, there's been this thing between Magic and Norm. Mm -hmm. How has that evolved for your character? At the end of season one, the arc goes from, you know, he's, he's a, a nemesis to me to getting along to fighting again to winning that championship. So, like, he's a, he's a brother. It's a love-hate relationship. But at the beginning, you know, he gets hurt, and I think that Norm now is like, here's my chance, you know, to show you guys exactly what I've been talking about. And the system was working great. Um, when Magic comes in, as you know, he's just, you know, a bumbling idiot kind of. You know, he doesn't know where to fit into the program, and he still thinks that he's Magic. He's a little right. bit slower. It's just not as fluid. And I think Norm, I think there's a little bit of envy mm -hmm. um, when he comes back because they just throw him right back out there. Everything just kind of falls apart. And I just think that Norm wanted his chance to shine, and I feel like he's the golden boy, and I feel like everybody puts him up on a pedestal. Whereas Norm, you know, he's been carrying the team since he's been there, and he doesn't get the credit. And I think that's what it is. And my dad was, you know, he was a veteran. He came in before Magic. So I feel like as Norm Nixon, you know, his character evolves, I feel like he doesn't think that he's getting his flowers. And I feel like he's always called out more so than Magic. So it's like, so he can do this, but if I do it, it's it, it's a problem. And yes. you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. where I think, like, the animosity and all the tension comes from. It's not necessarily Magic. I think it's, like, the coaching staff mm -hmm. and everybody. And there's all these rumors of trade, which just fuels Norm, you yeah. know? So it's not necessarily personal. And we have that scene where the two guys collide mm -hmm. when he's trying to do the system mm -hmm. for the first time, and mm -hmm. it's kind of awkward. Going for the inbound, what it looked like. And 
you know, I think some people would think, well, you know, why wouldn't he just help him and show him and all? But you don't have that margin of error mm-hmm. in that moment. You got to pick it up and go mm-hmm. for it's next man up. Exactly. And I think that, you know, at the beginning of the season, it's just like we've been gelling as a team. And it's like you're going to bring him in here and he's going to mess everything up. It's just like, come on, man, just run down the court. Give me the ball. Like we bumped into each other. I'm like, what, you trying to hurt me now, too? We want to win, man. It's just fall in line. Which is a great point. Because Norm was cool when Magic was running it and doing things his way when they were winning. Mm-hmm. And now, since Magic's been out, we have the system. Mm-hmm. And the system is working. Right. You wanting to go back, there is no guarantee that we're going to get the same results because we're getting the good stuff right now. Exactly. So fall in the line. That's all I think that Norm was really, really, really trying to say. And, you know, you probably took a little jab at him, too. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. You have to. You, <laughs> you have got to. to. And it makes it easier when Quincy's playing Magic. Exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. to, to anytime you get a jab or any kind of shot in on Quincy, I think it should be taken. <laughs> um, in the locker room, there's a moment where the team is sharing a laugh mm-hmm. and Magic's not part of the joke when he comes in. Mm-hmm. Do you think Norm is enjoying... Yeah. Magic being out. Because usually we see Magic as a dude with the boombox on his shoulder. Yeah. And he's singing a song and he's coming in and he's kind of the life of the party. Uh-huh. Now he's on the outside of the joke. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think he's enjoying it a little bit. A little sweet revenge, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Because he's just too loud <laughs> yeah. coming in before the yeah. games. Like, it's like, man, we trying to get ready. You right. like, up in here rapping and singing. <laughs> we stretching, bro. We got a game to play, man. <laughs> It's like, man, you relax, bro. Like, put on your uniform and let's get on the court. But, yeah, I think Norm is definitely having a ball. I shoot him a couple of glances, too. Yes. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. (laughs) And then go back to the guys. So, like, I feel like I'm a a little bit more in control. I definitely think my dad was getting at him a little bit. We talked a little bit about the system. Has your dad ever shared what the system meant to him or how any of that kind of stuff? (sighs) Might get in trouble. He said it was the worst thing in the world. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so that was the dumbest <laughs> offense in the entire world, man. He's like, how you going to have us all fast and slow down and play half court, man? He was like, get him out of here. I always felt like the offense that McKinney devised was like the best of street ball slash ABA style mm-hmm. with control. Exactly. Like there was a degree of control there. So you weren't just running all over the court doing like street ball, whatever you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But you were sort of heightening the idea of what everybody's attributes were. Mm -hmm. You got these guys that can run, jump, move. They're faster than everybody else. Exactly. They're more athletic than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Why not take advantage of that while you're in it? And it seemed like the system was one of those things that sort of slowed that down and made it so methodical Mm -hmm. that now you have to think rather than react. Mm -hmm. But to Paul Westhead's credit, they're winning. They are winning. They are winning. So there's a point in this story where Norm goes to the press Mm -hmm. and he vents his feelings. Look, this team works best when I'm at point. That ain't me, and that's a fact. Y'all saw it, right? Last three months, we was beating everybody. Now they got their magic back. And guess what? We lost all chemistry. 15 years from now, everybody will have forgotten magic. That's on the record. (laughs) It's on the record. Well, hey, how about this? Fuck it. They gonna trade my black ass anyway. Did your father give you any insight into that quote? You know, I asked him, I said, I was like, what really happened? He said, you know, we talked, but they twisted it, bent it out of shape. And I think that's just because, naturally, as we know, they wanted to make the trade. They wanted to get him out of there. So, yeah, I did ask him, but he said he didn't go to the press like that. That's not his thing. You know, he probably talked to a reporter, like, or or two or something like that on the low, and they, they just went and ran with it a little. You know, the funny thing to me, and I think one of the strong points of that storyline was in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, you really didn't hear players talking. They sort of almost had a script that they went by Mm -hmm. of, this is how you're supposed to talk to the press. Mm -hmm. But when you get into this Laker idea in modern basketball, you start to see the players express themselves freely to the press. Mm -hmm. They tell you how they feel. And I think that sort of heightened 
the relationship with the media and with the fan base and made it more personal mm -hmm. because now we're getting into the heads of the players. We aren't just talking about wins and losses. We're talking about feelings. Right. And when you look at the modern NBA right now, we're damn mm -hmm. near because of social media, damn near Everything. everybody's yeah. feeling yes. that there are no secrets yes. anymore. Yep. But I feel like the beginning of that is sort of now. The yeah. players have become part of the game beyond the play of the game mm -hmm. itself. And I just think that all of that was born during this period now mm -hmm. where you're getting into the characters of Dr. Buss and what the owner thinks mm -hmm. and what the coach thinks and what yeah. the players think, yeah. more so than just the wins and losses because, like you were saying, we're winning. Right. You would think as a fan base everybody mm -hmm. would be happy because it's supposed to be about wins and losses. Mm -hmm. But now you're getting this peek behind the veil of what's really happening. Yeah, man. What impact do you think the trade rumors had on your father? You know, my dad's my dad's a trooper. He's 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 competitive. You know, but I, I'm I don't think it made him want to go out there and not play good or not play his hardest. I just think it, you know, just messed with his mental. Right. Yeah, he was a little he was a little broken. And you know, my dad won't want me to say this, but I'm gonna say. I mean, you know, I love you, Dad. Anyway, let me just put that disclaimer out there. He has a, a license plate that says no trade on the back of um, ah. his, his, my stepmom bought him a Ferrari, I think in the midst of all of that. And um, he has on, on the license plate, it says no trade. Do you think that affected Norm the character as well? Yes. Is that was what was in your head? Yes. When you were, yes, okay. absolutely. Especially like that's the arc in my character, which is, which is, why season two, like, from for my character, he has a lot more depth is because, you know, he's in control of the team, Magic comes back, now all of these rumors of trades are happening, now I feel like everybody's going against me now. Could that contribute to the line, which is a quote, uh -huh. 15 years from now, everybody will have forgotten Magic? Yeah, that was, uh... <laughs> that was, that was a harsh one right there. Uh, yeah, I think he was... He was in his feelings a little bit, man. As I mean, as any human yeah. being would oh, be. Big time. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think, yeah. The thing I could empathize with is when you're part of a team and you're trying to win something, mm -hmm. you feel like it's a family. Mm -hmm. And a family, not just on the floor but in life, is supposed to have certain dynamics where we communicate and we're honest mm -hmm. and when the business part comes into the part that's supposed to be family, I don't think that ever works well right. for someone. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know how people say things that they don't mean, and I think in the moment it was just like, you know, something that he just said, but I don't think he thought it was going to blow up to something to that extent. But, I mean, maybe, 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 you know, I, I got to ask him about it. Maybe he knew exactly what was going to happen. Maybe he knew that the papers were going to find out and, you know, it was going to be magnified. But I, I just think he said it just in the heat of the moment, you know, just out Seems of animosity. like today they're cool, though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, they're friends. Like, you know, been on vacations together. You know, he goes to the Lakers um, reunions. And, yeah, they're all cool. And I saw Magic at the Laker game. He was like, tell your dad. I said, what up? I want to spend a little time on that moment in the locker room where Michael Cooper played by the dashingly handsome Delonte D'Souza, forces Norman Magic to make peace with each other by hugging. Both of you, you want to win? <laughs> I believe I asked a question. Do you want to win? More than course, anything, nigga, cool. Yeah. You know that. Then I want the fighting to stop right now. I mean it, both of you. Apologize. Apol I'm waiting. That was because Coop is so, you know, he's so quiet. He doesn't really talk that much, you know. My dad and Coop are, like, really good friends to this day. They make fun of each other all the time, even when they do the uh, the after-game shows and stuff yes. like that. But um, for him to explode like that, and that's just completely anomalous to his character, was a moment that I think made me and Magic realize, like, whoa, we are really tripping right now. Let's step back. We're still on the same team, and we still have the same exact goal. So I think it was a shock to, to both of us that he exploded like that because you never see him right. do something like that. Yeah, it made us just, like, feel something. We were really in that moment, man. Me and Quincy were, like, really going at it because when me and Quincy have to fight, like I said first season, like, we don't talk. Like, we right. just get, like, yeah, kind of yeah. method with it. Yes. You know what yes. I mean? 
because we just wanted to play well on camera. So it was it was kind of a similar thing like that. And then I walked up to him. I was like, you can't push me any harder, you punk, or something like that. I said something to him. I, <laughs> I said something to him. I don't know. I fueled him a little bit, and then we just went hard. When Magic misses the shot against Houston, oh. everybody misses shots. Mm-hmm. But in this moment, it seems like there's something beyond just missing a shot when Magic takes this shot in the first place. It was a selfish play. Uh, completely, completely selfish play. There were people open. He just, uh, I think that Magic wanted to be king. You think that played into the riff? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that pissed a lot of people off on the team. It's like, what are you doing, man? You got so many people open, wide open. You want to drive on three people? Like, what are you doing? Like, come on, team, 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 think team, not I, not magic. It's not all about magic, so. And then I think, too, again, in real life, that's actually how players react to somebody who's trying to take over and take it all themselves. Whether it's pickup or whatever, if somebody's, like, shooting every single time they go down the floor, it's like, pass the ball, man. Like, what are you doing? And I actually, like, you know, since I did play basketball and a couple of the cats did play basketball, that was real. It's like, dude, we are open. What are you doing? And so, yeah, those were real emotions right there because it's just like, come on, you going to lose? Wow. I actually did have an interview in the press junket, and they asked who, which actor had the best jumper. Mm-hmm. And I said you. Mm-hmm. But you do have a very nice jumper. Thank you. If I can drop 25 more pounds. Uh-huh. I'm going to try to play. If they had, like, a chunky Laker. Can you shoot, though? I'm, you... Come on, man. Okay, okay. I don't even like the way your voice went up that octave. I know. <laughs> Can you shoot, though? Can you really? I don't like to t- Like, the question was fine. The octave was the yeah, part that yeah, was the wrong. inflection on the end. Like, I can't believe you could possibly shoot a basketball. <laughs> well, Devon, once again, you've graced us with your presence. Thank you. Once again, I get to look at a man I'll never be as pretty as. <laughs> I would like to thank you for coming in. Thank you for your fine work in season two and from day one, actually. You are a huge part of the show. And thank you so much, Rodney. It's been a pleasure, always. It's time for the buzzer beater, our short segment about one key element of the winning time universe. There's another vital person who helps bring Norm Nixon to life on our show. That's body double Anthony Henderson. And Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, man. I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Can you talk about your basketball resume? Yeah, for sure. So basketball, it's really been my whole life since I was five years old. Originally from Ohio. Went to college at Bowling Green. Played there for four years. Um, Went to Canada. Played professional. And then I moved out here. Moved to L.A. Came out here, you know, to train, you know, because I wanted to, you know, continue to play basketball professionally. And then that's when I got the casting call of, just this uh, show coming out, just wanted some basketball players. So that's kind of where I got introduced to this at. But me and basketball was really, you know, that was it growing up. So when you found out about Winning Time, were you cast as the Norm Nixon body double? So no. So for season one, I think I was 12 different guys. (laughs) Yeah, I was all player for the Bulls, player for the Knicks, like all these different guys. And I would say I built up a a pretty good connection with Devon, you know, because I was gardening sometimes. I was world be free when he was gardening against uh, Norm Nixon in season one. So I think Devon kind of saw that. And, you know, he I think he really respected how I play basketball, how I carry myself. And I think that's kind of what when season two came around was like, I think you should be my body double, man. So that's kind of how it happened. How was it working with Adon Ravine, our basketball coordinator, and technically our basketball everyman? Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was so cool. You know, honestly, he's the one that gave me the chance for season one in the first place to even get me on the show. So it's actually a crazy story about how I got casted from Adon. So unfortunately for me, I pulled my groin like the day before the audition. So I was like, I'm still going. I'm still coming to this audition. There's no way I'm passing up this show. Like, it just is, I have to go. So I'm going in there limping, can barely even walk. And he, I think Adam was like, okay, so I want you to run up and down the court, you know, two times and do a crossover or something like that. And when I was going, I literally couldn't do it. Like, I was trying everything I could and was just limping up the court. So I walked over to him and I was like, my bad, Adam. You know, I, I tried to do give it all I could, but I pulled my groin yesterday, but I appreciate you for giving me the chance. He looked at me and was like, 
when you walk through the door, I was already going to pick you. You're good. Just rest up, and I'll see you in a couple weeks. Wow. So that's how it worked out. So I don't even know if he did his research on me or just, you know, I just fit the look. Like, I don't know what it was, but he he, he blessed me in a lot of ways right there. So you played on the blacktop. Yep. You played AAU ball, I'm assuming. Yep, yep, yep. And you played at Bowling Green. Yes, sir. Compared to what we do in making the illusion of basketball, mm-hmm. does it feel like the real thing? Does it compare in any way? I would say so, um, especially when we get those background fans in there and the cameras and everything, because there were a lot of cameras, you know, when I was playing yeah. in college and everything. Yeah. So it, it gives me that that rush that I get when I play, you know, in at Michigan State or when I played at Wisconsin. It, it felt that same way, like when we make a shot and the crowd goes crazy. So it's just second nature to just be able to play in front of all those people. But it was still you had a job to do, you know. It's a different type of job, but it was definitely a, a lot of similarities for sure. Do you see body double work as acting? I do. I do. I guess it's probably because how I grew up playing basketball. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very competitive. It's very, you know, you're trying to do whatever you can to beat the person that's guarding you, where in this sense, you know, it's it's a script. You know, at the end of the day, this isn't nothing where they can be like, hey, just go out there and we'll just film it and whatever happens, happens. No, it's like this is real 1980s Showtime basketball and real real stuff that happens. So right. you guys don't care if I can go out there and windmill right. and dunk. Like, we want to do exactly what Norm Nixon did in the 80s. Like, exactly. So it's it's kind of just turning that off, and I have a job to do, and it's a little easier than, I think, I mean, it's a lot easier than actual acting. But in a way, I, I would say it's acting. I look at it as acting. I mean, I think that the intensity that, in quotes, a real basketball player would have to right. have, you have to embody. Exactly. So when we're not on Devon's face, mm-hmm. And we're on you actually playing the game. You have to embody that player, that character that exactly. we're bringing to life. How much are you working with Devon to sort of create some type of harmony between the two of you? Oh, it was a lot. It was a lot. And I really appreciate him for, you know, being so open with me. And he was. it was times where he was just telling me his lines for some. I mean, it's not like I ever had to actually do the lines, but... If he's, you know, feeling some type of way on the court, you know, he's mad at Magic, you know, not passing him the ball or anything, I kind of need to know that. Okay. So, you know, when I'm running up the court and I'm I'm actually have to be pissed that Magic didn't, you know, give me the ball or, you right. know, he looked me off or different things like that. So, and I would have to actually tell him certain things too about on the court, you know, like I need you to come to the left side of the court and come up here. And, you know, I was always demonstrating. So when that he would come onto the court and do his part, it would be easy for him. So we worked a lot together and, I think I helped him out a lot, and he helped me out a lot as well. Cool, cool. And thank you for this today. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for making Devon look good. I'm glad that we have you to come in and make him, you know, look shiny and pretty and like his daddy. My pleasure. You know, I, was, I was glad to be a part of it. So thank, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the official Winning Time podcast. A special thank you to our guests, author Jeff Perlman, actor Devon Nixon, and body double Ant Henderson. Next week, we'll be back to talk about episode three. Let's see if the Lakers can recover from that first round loss. New episodes of the podcast come out every Sunday night after the latest episode of Winning Time, which airs on HBO. Make sure to subscribe wherever you find your podcast so you never miss an episode. I'm Rodney Barnes. We'll see you next week. The official Winning Time podcast is a production of HBO, Hyper Object Industries, and Pineapple Street Studios. Our producers are Bria Mariette, Noah Camuso, and Elliot Adler. Darby Maloney is our editor. Our engineers are Harry Nelson, Davey Sumner, and Jason Richards. Our executive producers at Hyper Object Industries are Harry Nelson and Claire Slaughter, with production support from Zaley Mahoney. Our executive producers from Pineapple Street Studios are Gabrielle Lewis and Barry Finkel. Our production music is courtesy of HBO. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt and Savon Slater at HBO Podcasts. 